Tonight we begin with a overview and I will stress the word overview because my colleague Sheikh Bilal Ismail, my colleague and friend, he teaches the Umayyad dynasty in a course for Al Kothar. It's called the First Kingdom. And he covers that in a two day course between 12 and 14 hours. And I I'm trying to cover the same period in two hours. So we ask for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assistance. Before we begin, we must uh, connect what we are discussing tonight to the beginning. So firstly, we want to look at the size of the Muslim state at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so as you can see on the map, that basically includes most of the Arabian Peninsula. And then during the time of the Khulafa al Rashidin, uh, that period lasted for about 30 years. So from 11 after the Hijrah until about 40 after the Hijrah. And our period of discussion is going to be from the year 41 until the year 132 after the Hijrah. So about 91 years. So we know that the Prophet ﷺ lived for 23 years. Yes? Okay. And then the four Khulafa who came after him. They ruled for 30 years because the Prophet said that leadership according to the prophetic model will be for 30 years. And so he died in the year 11 and Ali ibn Abi Talib was assassinated in Ramadan of the year 40. All right. So Muawiyah comes to power a few months later in the year 41. And that is the beginning of the Umayyad dynasty. Okay, so if you look at this map, subhanAllah, it is a massive, a massive uh, kingdom. All right, so stretching all the way from Portugal in the west and Morocco, all the way to what is today uh, parts of Pakistan, Iran, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and all of those countries, and basically on the border with China. That was the size of the Muslim state in the time of the Umayyads. So it is a massive, massive empire. And subhanAllah, uh, we have to ask ourselves um, a few questions and we'll answer them. If the Umayyad dynasty was in existence today, there would be 740 million people living in it. That will be the third largest country in the world. It would have an area of 14.4 million square kilometers. It would be the second largest country in the world. It would have a GDP of 5.51 trillion dollars. That would make it the third largest in the world. The largest city would be Cairo. And Cairo has a population of 16.3 million, but I think that's an underestimate. If anyone has been to Cairo, which I haven't, but according to my friends, like Mumbai, Mumbai has a population officially of under 20 million. But if you've ever been to Mumbai, you know that that sounds incredibly low. Uh, the city of Mumbai feels like you are on Hajj every, every day. Every day it feels like there's a Hajj going on. That's how many people you see on the streets and in the roads and on the train stations, etc. Right, so now that we have an idea, let's now look at the story of the Umayyad era. So we said it's 91 years. And there are four, 14 Khalifas, right? Only 14. Only 14. I say only 14 because the Ottomans had 36. 36, which we'll discuss on Wednesday. All right? There were two main families. So the Umayyad dynasty is basically two families. The first family is called the Sufyani family because they trace their lineage to Abu Sufyan. And then we have the second half. So there's only three Khalifas from that family. All right, I'll explain this later. There's only three Khalifas from that early Sufyani period. They are Muawiyah, Yazid, and the son of Yazid, Muawiyah. And get ready because the, the next few hours, today, tomorrow, and on Wednesday, there'll be a lot of similar sounding names. There's going to be a, like um, tomorrow night. Tonight, there's going to be a lot of Walids and Yazids. And on, uh, on Tuesday, tomorrow, there's going to be a lot of Abdullahs and a lot of Ali's and a lot of titles. Muntasir, Mutawakkil, 
you know, etc. Then on Wednesday, there's going to be a lot of Salims and Murads and Muhammads. Okay, so uh, we're going to have to deal with that, but I want to mostly focus. The reason why we're going to focus on the Sultans and the Khalifas is because they give us anchors as we go through the history. Do you know what I mean? Like if you look at Malaysian history, there was uh, Tun Mahathir and before him was Najib and before him was Tun Mahathir and then before that there was someone else. And so you, you see the years and then you can sort of plug in the details between those prime ministers, right? It makes it easier to do that if you're a student of history. Because if you just go with dates, dates are not so easy to remember as people and personalities and events. Right, so we want to sort of use that as an anchor. Now, the Umayyad dynasty, where does it get its name from? The name Umayyad, where does it come from? From the tribe of Banu Umayyah. So, you have Muawiyah, who's the founder. His father was Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan's father was Harb. And Harb's father was Umayyah. Abdul Muttalib and Umayyah were brothers. The Prophet's grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, and Umayyah were brothers. And their father was Abdul Manaf. This is why when the Byzantine emperor says to Muawiyah that now is the time for me to attack you, he said, this is during the civil war between Muawiyah and Ali, he says, if that happens, my cousin and I will unite against you. Who's he referring to? Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because in reality, they are related. They share a common ancestor. Okay? So this is very important, um, not only for tonight, but also for tomorrow. Because the Abbasids are also linked to the same lineage. So there's a lot of that happening, and we'll discuss that as we go along, inshallah ta'ala. Alright, so let's begin. The first Umayyad Khalifa was Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. And he came to power in the year 41. And this was after Hassan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. He abdicated after many of the Muslims that pledged allegiance to him. He stepped down and he pledged allegiance to Muawiyah. The reason why he did that was because he wanted to avoid bloodshed. Okay. Now, I know that many of you are sitting there and you're saying, uh, Sheikh, you're leaving out a very important part of the story. But the, the problem is that because of time, we don't have time to tell the story. So I'm going to say that there was a civil war between Ali and Muawiyah and they then came to some sort of negotiation or agreement and then when Ali ibn Abi Talib was assassinated in the year 40 as I said earlier many people pledged allegiance to his son Hassan the Prophet's grandson but when Hassan, when Hassan realized that the, the rivalry and the, the disagreement with Muawiyah was going to continue and that it was going to lead to bloodshed again. So he abdicated and he pledged allegiance to, to Muawiyah. Because he wanted to avoid bloodshed and he fulfilled the prophecy of the Prophet wasallam. The Prophet said that perhaps the son of mine, he will reconcile between two great factions of the Muslims. Perhaps the son of mine. And we see the permissibility of calling even your grandchildren, your son or your daughter. But the Prophet said that perhaps the son of mine, he'll reconcile between two great factions of the Muslims. And that's exactly what happened. Later, Hassan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib was poisoned. Okay, and this was in the year 41. And there are lots of competing theories as to what happened. And of course, the Shia have their theory, which is uh, when you read the books of, uh, of history, there's a reason why the Umayyad dynasty gets such a bad reputation. Who can tell me why? The Umayyad dynasty, most Muslims, they only hear propaganda. They don't actually get the real story. There's a reason for that. Who can tell me? Actually, there are two reasons. So, feel free to give me any one of them. Or both. Not necessarily, that, that, that fits into the narrative, but I'll just add to what you've said. That's a good point that you've made. The Battle of Karbala and the killing of Hussein is a reason, but there's a Shi'i narrative of the Umayyad dynasty as a whole. It, it starts with Ali ibn Abi Talib and it continues into the time of Hassan and then it continues into the time of Hussein and it goes throughout the Umayyad dynasty. 
the Shia and the family of the Prophet وسلم, specifically the descendants of Hussein and Hassan, they are sort of suppressed in the Umayyad time. Because if you are directly related to the Prophet وسلم, you have a better claim to, to leadership. You understand? So if I'm in power, I'm going to make sure that you never get to exercise that right. And this is exactly what happens to Hussein radiallahu anhu. Why is he killed? We'll explain. Anyway, we'll get there inshallah ta'ala. Where was I? What was I discussing before that? Yes, Muawiyah comes to power. The people pledge allegiance to him. And there's a few things that happened during his reign. We obviously can't talk about everything. But we know that the Khawaris continue to play a major role in, in, in the Muslim world. They are, and in fact, they are going to play a role for the next few centuries. It's not going to stop in the time of Muawiyah or the Umayyads or the Abbasids. I mean, even, even today, the state of Oman, the official madhab of the, the, the Sultanate of Oman is the Ibaldi school of thought, which is a Khawarij, um, which is a branch of the Khawarij sect. So even today in 2020, 1441, the Khawarij are still a player in the Muslim world. Right? So it's 14 centuries later and this, this issue is still with us. And a lot of the beliefs of the Ibaldis are very similar to those early Khawarij. Although they try to tone it down, but in reality, if you, if you are able to read the source books, their books, you'll see that there's, there's no much difference. We discussed one of those things a few nights ago. Who can tell me what it is? Some of the beliefs of the Khawarij. We were talking about takfir. Claiming that a Muslim has, has left the fold of Islam because he or she has committed a major sin. They believe that if part of your Iman leaves, all of it leaves. Iman is one solid you know, uh, um, uh, um, entity. If all of it leaves, if part of it leaves, all of it leaves. It's all gone. So if you drink alcohol, you gamble, you abandon the prayer, halas. You know, completely out of the fold of Islam. And so th they found it very easy to make takfir of the leaders. And this is why they fought against Ali, why they fought against Muawiyah. So this is one of the things that he had to deal with. The second issue was the Alawis. Now, and this is going to be something that's going to link up with tomorrow night's discussion. And that's the Abbasids. Because the Alawis, they are descendants of the Prophet Specifically, the descendants of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And more specifically, the descendants of Hassan and Hussein. Do you understand? So their right or their claim to leadership is because they are related to Hassan and Hussein and then Ali ibn Abi Talib and obviously from their mothers, from the, um, the, 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 the mother of Hassan and Hussein to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they are the, the descendants of the Prophet and they trace their lineage to one of the, one of the Khalifas. So they almost have like this double claim. To, to political you know, leadership in the Muslim world. So that's another thing that he has to deal with because not everyone, uh, in fact, here's something that you need to write down and remember. There was an agreement between Hassan and Muawiyah that should Muawiyah die before Hassan, that Hassan would then become the Khalifa. So I'll step down now, but if, if I pass away, I mean if you pass away, then I will become the Khalifa and that should not you know, and, and, and that should smooth the process in the future. But obviously, Hassan died first. And then, one of the things that we want to talk about today is that, and this is one of the most controversial things in the history of Islam, and that is that Muawiyah chose his son Yazid to be his successor. How did, let's go back in time a bit. How did Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu become the, the, the Khalifa of the Muslims? He was selected by the companions, right? And they understood that the Prophet ﷺ had left numerous indications of why Abu Bakr was the best person to lead the Muslims, okay? So the Muslims pledged allegiance to him. How did Umar become the Khalifa? He was selected by Abu Bakr and then confirmed by the companions. And this is an important issue. There is selection, but there still needs to be Confirma confirmation. So it's not enough that your predecessor said you are going to be my successor. It has to be confirmed by the community, specifically the most senior members of that community. How did Uthman become the leader? 
When Umar was on his deathbed, he nominated a committee of six people. And Uthman was one of them, Ali was also one of them. And then finally, that, that group of six, they had deliberations and discussions. And then finally, they decided on Uthman. They then pledged allegiance to Uthman and then the rest of the community pledged allegiance to Uthman. How did Ali ibn Abi Talib become the Khalifa? This is Muslim history. Got to know this stuff. It's very important because when we discuss uh, you know, uh, Islamic political theory, the concept of il- the, the, le- the election of a leader is very important. So there's, you know, there's going to be a lot of discussion about what happened in the past. How did it work before? So before we talk about this issue of a monarchy you know, and kingship, we need to find out what happened before Muawiyah radiallahu anhu did this. And the reality is that when Uthman was assassinated in his house, when did that happen? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. I make dua for myself and for you. They say that a nation that does not know his history has no roots. And we are in Ummah. Forget about Malaysia and South Africa as nation states. But when I say nation here, I mean an Ummah. And if we are an Ummah and we don't know our history, we are an Ummah disconnected from its roots. And any tree disconnected from its roots is a dead tree. So I might not be able to to discuss every aspect of Islamic history in this class or the next two. But you need to place a lot of importance in the study of Islamic history. You start with the Prophet ﷺ. In fact, you go, you go back further than that. You study the Prophets. There are these brilliant lecture series about you know, the story of the Prophets. Then there are books available in English. There are amazing lectures available. right? Then there's the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And if you go to any Islamic bookstore now, you're probably going to find 10 different books on the seerah. Am I right? Then there are books available on Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali. In fact, the book about Ali is in two volumes by Dr. Ali al-Salabi from Libya. So, in fact, in our times, in this year, 2020, we have absolutely no excuse for being ignorant about early Islamic history. There are not many books. In fact, I don't know of any, um, any good book in English on the Umayyad dynasty, especially written by a Muslim. I don't know of any good books written about the Abbasid dynasty in English. So we're going to have to wait for a lot of these books to be translated. Like Dr. Ali al-Salabi, he's got the, the Seerah, he's got the four Khulafa, he's also got the Umayyads and the Abbasids, and he's also got uh, Salahuddin al-Ayyubi and the, you know, the Crusades. Um, he's also got the Ottoman Empire. So I'm sure that someone must be busy, I hope, with translating these books into English so that we can sort of have this complete you know, set of Islamic history books. Well, there's a scholar who wrote um, in Arabic, he wrote a history of, 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 of Islam in 20 volumes. That's in Arabic. And it's really well done. It basically, it's, it's his whole life he dedicated to that project. But khair, let me, let me stop lamenting and complaining and uh, let's come back to our issue. Uthman radiallahu anhu was killed in the year 36 in Dhul Hijjah, 35 Dhul Hijjah. Um, he was assassinated. And then a few days later, the people of Medina, they pledged allegiance to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And later, other parts of the Muslim world also pledged allegiance to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Okay? But then what happened was that because the, the killers of Uthman were, still, were not yet being punished, Muawiyah, who was Uthman's cousin, he wanted Ali to deal with that issue first. And Ali's perspective was, well, I need to consolidate power. I need to first establish myself. And then we can deal with these people. Lots of different reasons. So what happened was that that caused a lot of conflict between them, which finally ended in war. The battle of Muawiyah and Ali, they fought. There was a civil war. And before that, you had the battle of the camel. But all of these things were happening in the Muslim world. So there was a lot of conflict. Now, you have to understand why is Muawiyah appointing his son? When they are obviously better qualified people, to lead the Muslims. More pious, 
better administrative and military experience even amongst the Sahaba because look at Muawiyah only dies in the year 60 so there's a lot of companions who are still alive right they are still very qualified people to you know to lead the Muslims why his son the reason why he chose his son is not necessarily because he's a father he loves his son he wants his son to be you know his follower because the Umayyad dynasty is is now entrenched in power and he feels that if he if, if, if he was to nominate someone outside of the Umayyad dynasty or family then, then the same issues that they were dealing with in the year 40 and 41 are going to raise their ugly head again that's one of his main motivations because he knows that if he appoints his son he'll have the loyalty of the Umayyads who are in power already does it make sense so it's like Tun Mahathir chooses his son to be you know his successor if he could do this but obviously it's more complicated now but and the reason why he does that is because he knows that he's going to have more than 150 of the members of parliament agree with the nomination of his son you understand so even though there'll be another 70 people who don't agree with that tough luck but he knows he'll have the majority and because the Umayyads make up most of the Muslim army they have the strongest army in the region all of these are reasons why Muawiyah chooses his son is was it the right choice Allahu A'lam but from his perspective and this is always important when we're studying history from the perspective of that person it was the right choice to make and we will we can disagree and this is always the problem when you when you think about something after you know when you go back a few decades a few centuries you're like hmm why did that person do that he shouldn't have done that he should have done this or that well you were not in his shoes you don't understand the situation anyway that's what he did and he then sent out messengers to all the major cities um, requesting and commanding that they pledge allegiance to to his son Yazid and there was a lot of opposition a few people refused to take their pledge of allegiance write down their names because they're going to be important for later one of them was Al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abdul Muttalib and the other is Abdullah ibn Zubair these are very important names so they refused to pledge allegiance to to to, to Yazid now let's talk about some positive things or some things that are going to bode well for the future there were a lot of conquests in the time of Muawiyah but the two that I want to focus on not conquest really but attempts at conquest in the time of Muawiyah these are the first Muslim attempts to conquer Constantinople right the first one was in the year 49 the Muslims uh, attempted to um, to bombard the, the city walls but as we can see and as we will see it's not it's not easy there have been more than 20 sieges of Constantinople they were all failures except when Muhammad the second the Uthmani Sultan when he sieged the city and he put it under siege was he able to be successful so there have been more than 20 attempts but only in the year 1453 was a Muslim army able to breach the city walls and take the city so it wasn't easy so the first one was 49 that was both a naval and a land siege and then the second one between the years 54 and 60 this was only a naval siege yes all right that's a very good question why is it important to conquer that city from a Muslim perspective it is because the Prophet وسلم, said that the army that conquers Constantinople will be forgiven right this hadith is in Sahih Bukhari then the second hadith is the fact that the Prophet وسلم, said that my ummah will the, uh, an army from my ummah will conquer Constantinople and what a wonderful leader its leader will be and what an, what an what a wonderful army its army will be right that army that conquers Constantinople so there was this religious motivation to conquer the city a strategic uh, reason is because the city of Constantinople is between Europe and Asia right so the Bosphorus and the uh, Sea of Marmara is what separates um, Anatolia the, the the Asian part from the rest of of Europe so it's, it's right there also another important reason is because Constantinople is one was one of the biggest cities 
right, in, in, in human history, and at least at that time, right? It had this long history going back to the 4th century. So, you know, it was named after Constantine uh, the Great. So he was a Roman, a Roman uh, emperor that made his capital because the, that city used to be called Byzantium, all right? And then he named it after himself. I also want to do that one day when I, when I conquer a city. You know, what can I name it? When I make my capital, what should I call it? No, that's not really a city, you know, that's just a mountain. Jabal Tariq. You know, I want to I wanna give it a name, like, should I call it, uh, should I call it Medina to Tufah? Huh? The, the city of the apple. Huh? <laughs> anyway, so Constantinople had all of this, it was very significant, very, very significant, okay? And, um, as we will talk about on Wednesday, in fact, let's wait. This discussion can wait until next week, Wednesday. I mean, Wednesday, inshallah. Right, what was I saying? Yes, so Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, he was responsible for a lot of these conquests. And his relationship with the Byzantine Empire, at the time the Muslims were dealing with all of these internal issues. So he agreed to pay the Byzantine uh, emperor in Constantinople uh, a yearly fee. So that to get the guarantee from that uh, emperor that he would not attack the Muslim land. And it was quite heavy, right? It was quite heavy. I forget the exact amounts now, but it was a few hundred thousand gold coins. It was a number of slaves and also a number of horses that the Muslims had to pay to the Christians on a yearly basis so that that, 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 that border with Turkey, what is today Turkey, could be secure. But that's another issue, inshallah ta'ala. Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, he died in the year, um, 60 in Rajab of the year 60 and his son Yazid then came to power so let's talk about that this is the city of Constantinople as you can see here that's a 14 kilometer wall 14 miles so it's much longer than that all right and then on this side it's also got these sea walls the sea of Marmara and then you have the Bosphorus and then you have the golden Warn. all right so if you take the Bosphorus this way then you will be in the Black Sea. And if you go with the Sea of Marmara, you'll go, you'll go through the Dardanelles and you'll be in the Aegean Sea. Right? And then you'll be in the Mediterranean. So there's all of these things. I mean, the this, this city is super important. Because all of the grain that is, being, that is being grown in the Ukraine is coming from that southern, that southern coast, from the ports, and it's coming down through the Bosphorus, and that's how it's getting to the Mediterranean. So it's super important. And this is one of the reasons why after World War, World War I, the Allies, they want control over these areas. Because they understand that having control over this is going to, it's not only strategic, but also economic. We will talk about that on Wednesday. Khair. The second um, Khalifa was Yazid ibn Muawiyah. All right. Now, Yazid ibn Muawiyah, he's, he comes to power, and obviously there are certain, um, there are certain personalities in the Muslim world who do not want him to be the Khalifa. There's a lot of issues related to him. Uh, some people say that, you know, he, um, he was known for his, his love of hunting. Um, there's a lot of rumors about his consumption of alcohol. Um, so whether or not this is true or false is, is, very, is not really important. But you have to understand that because his father took the Pledge of Allegiance for him, the Bay'ah, there was always going to be opposition to the concept and then there was going to be opposition to the person. You understand? Like it, the, 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 the way he became the Khalifa was, was problematic. And then people were going to look for additional reasons to disqualify him from that position. Right? But anyway, there was a few things that happened during his time. Lots of things. We'll just talk about three. The first of them is Karbala. So in the year 61, the people of Kufa, they write to al Hussein in Makkah. This is the Prophet's grandson, radiallahu anhu. They write to him that if he comes to Kufa, they will pledge allegiance to him as the Khalifa of the Muslims. But, he sends his cousin to go to Kufa to find out if these people are serious. Why is there a hesitation on his part to find out if the people are serious? Because these people had already abandoned his father during his father's uh, conflict with uh, Muawiyah. 
Right? Again, background history that we don't have time to get into. But you have to understand that he's, there's hesitation. Like, for instance, if, if the Prime Minister of Malaysia, if, um, please, if, you, if you're from, if you're from, uh, from uh, Klantan, I apologize in advance, it's only an example. Okay? But let's say that a former Prime Minister was promised support by you know politicians and leaders from Klantan and then when the when the day in which he needed that assistance didn't materialize he's obviously going to now he's obviously going to feel that these people have betrayed him right now if his successor is in that same position is he likely to trust the word of the Klantanese no he shouldn't be right so this is similar to that scenario. So what he does is he sends someone to Kufa to find out if these people are serious. What happens is that thousands of the people, some, some say 12,000, some say 18,000 people pledged allegiance to his cousin. He writes a letter. The letter gets to, gets to Makkah. Hussein gets ready to leave. And I'll just show you a map. So he leaves Makkah and he travels towards Karbala. And as you can see, Karbala is on the outskirts of of Kufa. It's not too far. But he's intercepted by an Umayyad army who then give him, you know, a few ultimatums. He can either go back from where he came, go back to Makkah, or number two, you go to Damascus and you raise your issues with Yazid directly. But you don't, you can't go to Kufa. Because they know what, you, what is going to happen in Kufa. You understand? If you have a problem with Yazid, go to Damascus and put your hand in his hand. You either explain your issues to him or you pledge allegiance to him. Or number three, you go to one of the jihad centers in the Muslim world and you go there and fight in jihad. But there's no way we are allowing you to go to Kufa. What ultimately happens is that he refuses all of this. And the next day on the 10th of Muharram in the year 61 is when he goes, to, he goes into battle against the Umayyad forces who outnumber him by... By, by thousands really they, um, the battle is over very quickly because he's outnumbered and Hussein and about, list, about 80 of his entourage are also killed many of his sons cousins and other people are also killed and he is, his head is removed from his body and it is sent to it is sent to Damascus All right? so I want you to, to make a note of this this, this day the Prophet ﷺ's grandson is, is killed. It is the rallying point for Shia Azim to this day. It is the central, it is the most important day on the Shia calendar. The 10th of Muharram is the Ashura, right? Ashura is the most important day in Shia Azim. If you look at the celebration, I won't call it celebrations, but if you look at the, um, what can we call it if not celebrations? Because they are not celebrations. Memorials, right? Let's call it a memorial. So what happens on, on the 10th of Muharram in, in Shia, you know, areas around the world like Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan and other places shows how important this day is so anyone who tells you that history does not impact the present for the past does not impact the present that person is either a fool or misinformed or that person is ignorant i mean there might be other names we can call that person but this is the reality that's to this day people are still remembering this fondly as we'll talk about on wednesday the uh, Ottomans defeated the Serbians in a massive battle in Kosovo. To this day, the Serbians still commemorate that day. And this happened like four or five hundred years ago, but they still remember it like it was yesterday. It's still part of their customs, and their, their tradition, their culture. Right? I'm sure that, well, what days in Malaysian, in Malaysian history do you look back at either fondly or sadly? <laughs> Last week, what happened last week? <laughs> no, no, that doesn't count. That doesn't count. But on a serious note, what happened on May 13th? Beheaded. Subhanallah. 
I knew there were those race riots. I didn't know it was that violent, was it? Allah A'lam. We, we will do some reading, inshallah. I must, I must confess, I know very little Malaysian history. I, what fascinates me most is why Singapore not part of Malaysia. Or Brunei. These are, these are all areas where Malay is the dominant language, but there is this uh, separation. Anyway, we got back where we were discussing this issue. So that was Karbala. Then there was the incident of the Harra. After Karbala, you had the people of, of Medina refuse to pledge allegiance to, um, to Yazid. So they rebelled against him. So Yazid sent an army to Medina. And then in Dhul Hijjah of the year 63, uh, what's a Harra, by, by the way? Does anyone know? What's a Harra? A Harra. A Harra is a massive field of volcanic, of volcanic rock. A massive field of volcanic rock. And in Medina, to this day, there is something called Al Harra Tul Gharbiya wa Al Harra Tul Sharqiya. The east and the west Harra. So on the east and the west of Masjid al Nabawi, in the past, there used to be this ma these massive fields of volcanic rock because Medina is surrounded by volcanoes. Yes. The last uh, major eruption was in the 7th century after Hijrah. It was so big that the, the lava flowed into the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. And the eruption was so big that you could see the fire or at least the volcanic eruptions uh, outside of Damascus. So this was... This was huge. It wasn't a small, you know, and part of the Masjid, Masjid Nabi was, Nabi was destroyed during that, uh, that volcanic eruption. So there was a fire in the city, etc. Anyway, what was I saying? Yes, a Harra. So this is where the battle took place. And the, the army of Medina was basically massacred. And then the city of Medina was pillaged for three days. So this is one of the most painful incidences in in uh, Umayyad, uh, Umayyad history. It's like, a, it's like a dark stain on their history. Karbala, and then this. And then the third issue is the siege of Makkah. Because Abdullah ibn Zubair, people pledged allegiance to him. All right? Instead of Yazid. So he considered himself to be the Khalifa. Who pledged allegiance to him? The people of the Hijaz, Makkah and Medina, and the people of Iraq. Okay. Later, others, other, uh, you know, other provinces would also pledge allegiance. Who's Abdullah ibn Zubair? Okay, who's Zubair? Let's start with the easy questions. Zubair ibn al Awam, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's companion, the one who was given glad tidings of Jannah. Who is the mother of Abdullah? Asma, the sister of Aisha and the daughter of Abu Bakr. Right, so this is Abdullah ibn Zubair. He is, he's got so many, he's got so many credentials. All right, and so the people pledge allegiance to him. And in reality, as we'll discuss later, many ulama of the time considered him to be the legitimate Khalifa, and they considered Yazid to be an imposter. And this is going to continue for another few decades because Abdullah ibn Zubair is only killed in the year seventy-three. All right. This is when Marwan ibn al-Hakam and then his son, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Don't worry, their names will appear on the slides just so that there's a, there's a link. But you can see that this is a major issue in the Muslim world. The siege of, of, um, of Makkah, why is it significant? Who can tell me? No, that's not that, this is not as bad as what's going to happen later. In the year 73, it's really bad. Because by that time, most of the army of, of Abdullah is killed. The Kaaba is destroyed partly or partially. And um, the problem is here that it's the city of Mecca. How can you have a siege of the city of Mecca? And how can you erect catapults outside of the city to bombard the Masjid, the masjid al-Haram? Do you understand the problem here? Why is this such a major issue? Why are we giving it such importance? Because if a siege happened outside of the city of Kufa, yeah, okay, well, it's the city of Kufa or Basra. No one would really give it that kind of importance because now you have a Muslim army surrounding an, a Muslim city and bombarding that city with catapults and trying to storm the city. And it's no, it's, it's no ordinary city. It's Makkah and within that is Masjid al-Haram and within that is the Kaaba. 
So this, the most sacred space in, in Islam is being attacked by Muslims. That's what makes it so significant. All right? But this was all happening in the time of Yazid ibn Muawiyah, but he dies in Rabiul Awwal of the 64th year. All right. Now who do you think is going to become the Khalifa after him? Yes, Muawiyah ibn Yazid. And he, we have very little information about him. We know that he was about 26 years old when he died. Um, he was known apparently for his, for his piety. He ruled for about six months, but then he sort of abdicated and he then just left the affair to the rest of the family to decide who was going to be the next Khalifa. Alright, now the problem here is now, now there is going to be competition for who is going to, who is going to succeed him. Okay, so this is the end of the Sufyani branch of the, of the, um, of, of the Umayyad. Just make a note here, the, the Sufyani branch starts with a Muawiyah and it ends with a Muawiyah. And the Marwani branch starts with the Marwan and it ends with the Marwan. These are just coincidental facts. It makes it easier to remember certain things. Right? So I told you that there were two main families in the Umayyad dynasty. The Sufyanis and the Marwanis. The Sufyani branch starts with Muawiyah, ends with Muawiyah. The Marwani branch starts with the Marwan and it ends with a, with a Marwan. And we'll talk about that as we go along. So when this happens... The Umayyads outside of Damascus is a city or a village called Al Jabiyah, and this is where they decide unanimously to appoint Marwan ibn al Hakam as the next Khalifa. But he does not rule for very long. He dies a year later, and there's a lot of internal conflict between the Umayyad factions. In fact, there's a brief civil war between the Umayyads themselves, and that finally ends with Marwan ibn al Hakam consolidating his power. Before he dies, he sends an army to deal with Abdullah ibn Zubair in Mecca. And he appoints his sons. One of them is Abdul Malik. And the other one is Abdul Aziz. But Abdul Malik is the one that becomes the next Khalifa. Right? So the fifth Khalifa will be Abdul Malik. And write this down as well. There were only four out of the 14 Umayyad Khalifas that were strong rulers. When I say strong, I don't mean that they were super powerful or you know, super pious. I mean that they... They achieved a lot during their time. And the Muslim Ummah, there's a lot of stability in the, in the Muslim world during the reign of these four. The first of them is Muawiyah. The second is Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. The third is Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik. And the fourth is Hisham ibn Abdul Malik. Don't worry, their names will also appear. But just four. Number one, Muawiyah. And he ruled for about 20 years. Then there was Abdul Malik, and he ruled for about uh, 21 or 20 years. All right. Then there was Al Walid ibn Abdul Malik, he ruled for about 10. And then there was Hisham ibn Abdul Malik, who ruled for about 20. So between them, they basically ruled for most of those 91 years, and their rule was one of stability and prosperity. All right. Anyway, so he died in Ramadan of the year 65. We move on to the fourth, to the fifth. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan comes to power. And as I said earlier, most of the Muslim world, they consider that Abdullah ibn Zubair is the legitimate Khalifa. So even though, listen very carefully, even though the view of many of the ulama of the time and after this time is that Abdullah ibn Zubair is the legitimate Khalifa of the Muslims and that Abdul Malik ibn Marwan is a rebel. When that army of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, that Umayyad army, lay siege to the city of Mecca in the year 73 and they are able to, to kill Abdul, uh, Abdullah ibn Zubair then everyone who pledged allegiance to to Abdullah ibn Zubair now pledged allegiance to Abdul Malik ibn Marwan and in reality this, this year, the year 73 is when he really becomes the legitimate leader of the Muslims right, where there's no, there's no real disagreement anymore but between the year 65 and 73, there is obviously now lots of questions about his legitimacy as a, as, as a leader. Anyway, a lot of things happened during his time. Wallahi, one can probably write a book just about Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, but we'll just talk about a few things. One of those things that he did was the Arabization, the Arabization, 
I always get this uh, pronunciation wrong. But he basically institutes a rule that all state records must be in Arabic. Anyone that works in the bureaucracy of the state must know Arabic. So if you're a Christian or a Jew, you're Armenian, whatever you might be, if you need to know Arabic, everything now from this point onwards, Arabic is going to be the main focus. right? What, the language that's taught, state records, the coins themselves, because he also establishes the concept of like their own coins. So what were Muslims using before this? What kind of, whose coins were they using? Mostly Roman coins. So now, from this point onwards, we are going to have a special, you know, that's why even to this day, you still have coins from that time. Because this is when it starts, and that those are highly prized coins now. You can see this in the, uh, the British Museum. One of my friends, he uh, was in London a few years ago, and he posted some pictures on his uh, Instagram. The Khalifa, and after him, his brother. Alright, so let's look at that. So the sixth Umayyad Khalifa is Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik. And he, like I said, he rules for 10 years. The state reached its peak in his time. So this was also a time of great internal stability. Very few rebellions, very few internal conflicts. And he's able to deal with all of this. He was known for his piety also. He was known for his ability to, to deal with, uh, you know, with, with people, with wisdom and with uh, compassion if you will now if you ask anyone of you are asked when was Spain or Al-Andalus when was it conquered then you will say it was conquered during the time of Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik all right this is in the year 92 this is when the Muslims go over the Straits of Gibraltar from Morocco they enter Spain and then from there for the next few decades and then for the next few centuries the Muslims control Portugal what is today Portugal and Spain and we will discuss more of this history when we look at the Abbasids because one of the issues that they have to deal with is that the Umayyads re-established themselves in Spain and that's why you have the Umayyad dynasty in Spain for a, a number of years not very long maybe 140 years and then after that it basically becomes a um, they call them the king the Tawa'if so there's all these competing states you know, it's, it's like Malaysia have how many provinces State, uh, uh, states 13 14 why is there is a debate okay so that makes it 14 all right so just imagine now that right now you have 14 states all under one umbrella but imagine a time when all of those 14 states become independent countries each with their own passports and ambassadors etc etc so this is exactly what happened in spain there was unity under one under one dynasty and then it basically broke up in fact some ulama say that at one time there were more than 30 independent territories in spain perhaps i'll show you a map tomorrow night we can see how the city uh, i mean the the uh, spain basically you know starts to grow smaller and smaller and smaller until it's only al andalus in the south and then by 1492 it's gone so that's 500 years oh no not 500 that's much longer 800 years of Muslim presence in the Iberian Peninsula and it's gone in fact there are only two places in the Muslim world where the Muslims were and now are not there anymore at all or do not have majority populations there one is Spain and the other no majority they were the majority and now they are no longer there say again Cecilia where's Cecilia Oh, Sicily. I'm not sure. No. We were never the majority in India. The Mughal Empire, even at its height, they were always outnumbered. The Muslims were always...